Well, good morning. It's great to see everyone. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be here today. I was raised in this church, and it is a gift to be back here. Now, if you weren't here earlier in the service, you may be sitting there wondering, who are you and what have you done with Pastor Tom? And, and did you force him to make that video? I didn't. That was wonderful. That was so good. Um, and today, that's actually what we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about who we are in Christ. But first, I want to share with you about who I am, just briefly. There should be some pictures of my family up there. But if you ask me, who are you? I would obviously share my name, Brian Barnett, that this is my family, my wife, Brooke, my son, Graham, my daughter, Kara. Uh, the picture on the top right there is a picture of me in youth group here at this church. I'm in the bottom right of that top picture. I look like I was four years old, but I was 14, I believe, in that picture here at Duto. Uh, my wife and I help lead a ministry for college students in Southeast Virginia. Our goal is to help college students know about Christ, walk with God while in college, and send them out equipped to live for God for a lifetime. And like I mentioned, I was raised here in this church. I started at preschool here. I was involved with every vacation Bible school as a kid, also volunteering. I was involved with the youth group. Some of my old youth group leaders are here. It's such a blessing to see them. Um, I went on mission trips. I went to Jamonville every summer when I was in college. I worked as a counselor there. Dutill is in my blood, and I thank God so much for this church. Now, if I ask you, who are you, you might answer some similar things just about your name, maybe your job, maybe your involvement in this church since we're here today. But today I want to talk about who does God, our Father in heaven, say that we are? Who does he say that we are? And again, being raised in this church, that is one of the things that has stuck with me the most. I feel like I heard time and time again being a part of this church. I learned about who I am as a child of God. Who I am as a child of God. And I believe that the truths that you will hear today from Scripture, that if you believe these things about who you are in Christ, if you believe these things, it will make all the difference in your life. It will affect the decisions you make. It will affect how you get through trials. It will affect how you handle life when it gets oh too crazy. It can help you experience peace and joy no matter your circumstances. And isn't that what we want? To experience the power of God, the peace of God, the joy of God in our lives. And I believe that if you know who you are who God says that you are, that it will make all the difference in your life. So we read Ephesians 1, 3 to 7. I want to read briefly part of that. It should be up on the slide for you. And in this passage, it shares four things about who you are. So it starts off by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pause right there. This verse starts with blessing God or praising God for being our father. And with today being Father's Day, I just want to acknowledge that Father's Day for many people can be really, really exciting and wonderful. For other people, maybe Father's Day opens up a big wound in your life. Maybe you had a difficult father or maybe your father has recently passed away. I just want to let everyone know in this room, if you remember anything from this message, that you have a father in heaven who loves you and adores you. There is a father in heaven, no matter your earthly father, there is a father in heaven who loves you and cares about you and is looking after you. Okay, and then this Father in heaven, four things that he says about you. Number one, he says in verse four that you are chosen. You are chosen by him. What a blessing that even though we are dead in our sins, that God chose us. He chose to extend his grace through Jesus Christ to offer salvation, to give you a relationship 
a relationship with God and peace with God. Isn't this amazing? This is something that if you come to this church, maybe you hear every single Sunday that God has made a way for you through Jesus Christ. But I just want to remind you that since 1998 in this church, I realized that God loves me and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. And by placing my faith in him, it makes all the difference that I am chosen by God. And since 1998, it has made all the difference in my life. This is an amazing truth that God has chosen you. He's picked you. So if you're a teenager here, if you're in the youth group and sitting in the balcony, I don't know if you still do that, but that's what I did when I was in youth group. Sitting in the balcony, if you're a teenager, he picked you. He picked you for the team. He picked you to be a part of his family. If you're a parent here with young kids and you're feeling overwhelmed like I do as a father many times, I want to let you know that God chose you for this moment to parent those kids and to be with him. If you're a senior citizen here, like my parents, let my parents, Gary and Barb, they don't want me to call them that, but they've been at this church for 36 years, loving the people here, serving at this church. If you're a senior citizen in here and at times maybe you're feeling lonely, I want to let you know that God chose you and that God loves you. Speaking of choosing, um, like I mentioned, we have two kids. We adopted both of our kids. We dealt with infertility for years and years and years. And ultimately, we just said, God, however you would form our family, let it be. And so it led us to adopt a child from China, Graham. And uh, we picked him out of many different cases, many different kids, through prayer, through talking with mentors, through talking with doctors, we picked Graham. If you go to the next slide, there should be a picture of him. We picked him, yeah. That's him when he was just two years old in an orphanage in China. And we picked him out of all of the kids. Um, it was not an accident that we chose him. And a year later, after we had made that decision, we flew to China and we were getting ready to meet him. And we were with a few other families who were also going to meet their child for the very first time. And the leaders of the trip told us, you're about to meet your child. I just want to let you know that when you meet them, they are likely going to be crying and screaming and clinging to their nanny. They're not going to want to go to you. You're not familiar to them. They probably have a picture of you, but that's it. So we're in China. It's about 195 degrees. Like it's going to be all this week in Cranberry. Um, and we walk into this building, we're with a few other families, and they start, someone starts yelling from upstairs, Zheng Hao Duo is here, which is actually our son's Chinese name. He was already there. We hear them say, come up, come up. So we kind of run up the stairs, we start sprinting down the hallway, we get into this room, and our son Graham is being held by a nanny. And do you know what he does immediately when he sees us? He puts his arms out and he says, Mama, Baba. Mama, Baba, biggest smile on his face, so, so happy to see us. And immediately, in Chinese, he asks us, do you want to play with me? And I'm like, for sure, come on. <laughs> and in that moment, I realized that God had planned for us to choose Graham, but also that God had planned for Graham to choose us. He was so delighted to see us. And I just want to tell you that that is just a small glimpse into the magnitude of how God, our Heavenly Father, has chosen you to be a part of his family. Similarly to this, uh, the second thing that God says about you is that you are adopted into his family. In love, verse, um, verse 5 says that in love, he adopted you. He grants us full status as his children, all the benefits that come from that. We have security, we are no longer orphans, this is truly a radical idea that all are welcomed into the family of God. It's not based on what you do. It's not based on status, but it's by the grace of God through our faith in him. This is amazing. Everyone is welcome into the family of God. Similarly, we adopted our daughter, Kara, from the foreign land of Florida, and uh, we adopted her as a newborn. That's a picture of her. And uh, we were waiting months and months for the birth mom who picked us 
uh, to go into labor. And we were just going about our day in 2016, 2015. And uh, we were waiting and waiting. And then suddenly we get a call on a Saturday that says, the birth mom is in labor, get down here. So we throw all kinds of things into our car. It's a 12-hour drive. About 10 minutes later, we get a text message that says, the baby's been born, the mom and the baby are healthy, get down here. So we have a 12-hour drive to get down there. My wife, for whatever reason, packed only heels and dresses, even though we were going to spend a week in the hospital. Um, she wanted to look nice, I guess. But we weren't thinking clearly, obviously. Uh, but we drive down there. We drive six hours. I may or may not have been going over the speed limit. The church is a place to also confess. Um, <laughs> Halfway down, we stop at a restaurant just really quick. I tell my wife, go in, order some food, go to the bathroom. I got to check to make sure we have everything. I check in the back. I run into the bathroom. And when I run into the bathroom, I see my wife, Brooke, and I say, why are you in the men's room? And she says, why are you in the women's room? <laughs> I was in the women's restroom. Uh, my mind was not thinking clearly. I just wanted to get down there and be with my daughter. So we drive the other six hours. It's late at night. We park in the hospital parking lot. We go up to the sixth floor. There's lots of babies that we see. They make us change. And then suddenly, almost out of nowhere, they hand me Kara. And immediately, unplanned, what do I tell her? I love you. I love you. I love you. You are mine, and we are yours. I love you. I love you. I love you. My wife, Brooke, said, I probably said it. 400 times. I couldn't top, stop telling her that I love her. And I didn't plan that. I didn't like plan in advance to tell her that I love her. And I want to tell you that, again, this is just a small glimpse into what God feels about you. He has adopted you into his family, and he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. There's a great verse about this in Romans 8 that we also read, but I want to read it again and talk about it briefly. It says in Romans 8, 14 to 17, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons and daughter by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. My do tell friends, if you are dealing with fear and anxiety, if you want to get rid of fear and anxiety in your life, know who God says you are as a child of God. If you want to experience freedom from addiction or sin or whatever you're wrestling with, know who you are as a child of God. If you want to experience the great blessings of God, know that you are a child of God and a co-heir with Christ meaning we have an eternal inheritance that comes from God and that we get to experience all the fruits of Christ's labor. We get to experience joy and peace and patience and kindness and all of those wonderful fruits today as we place our faith in Christ. Isn't that an amazing promise? You are a part of the family of God and you get to experience all the benefits of that. Okay, Two other things quickly that God says that we are from Ephesians 1, 7, which should be up there. He says that you are redeemed. This is done by his grace, which we'll talk about briefly. But through Christ's sacrifice, redemption means that he has bought our freedom. He has paid a ransom by his death and that he has freed you. There's a price for our sins and this payment was given by Christ, and it was fully paid by the blood of Christ. We now experience deliverance from bondage, the bondage, bondage of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. What a great, great promise that is. And similarly, in verse 7, it says, you are forgiven. No matter what you've done, if you've come in here uh, feeling so much guilt or weight in your life, Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. God has forgiven you. You no longer have to carry guilt and shame and pain. He has forgiven us and there's no condemnation, no matter what you've done. Isn't this a great promise? That through Christ, we are forgiven. 
I want to share a brief story related to this about uh, someone in our ministry in Southeast Virginia. Uh, we work with college students, and I got a call from the D1 baseball coach because some of our uh, students were involved with the team there, playing on the team. And he gave me a call, and he said, hey, our star player, he's really struggling. We don't know what's going on. Can you meet with him? I said, sure, would love to. So uh, don't know what this guy looks like. I tell him to meet me in the student center. He shows up, and he's about 6'10", 250. And I'm looking up at him, and I just say, do you want to sit down? I'm a little intimidated. Um, we catch up. We, we talk a little bit about his baseball life, our ministry. And then I just ask him, what's been bothering you? And he shares with me that he just feels so weighed down about all the responsibilities in life. He feels like he's gotten everything that he hoped for, being a D1 athlete, a girlfriend, going to a school that he loves. And he says, actually, none of it has been fulfilling. He says, I feel guilty about the things I'm doing in my life. I have anxiety and I have depression. And I ask him, have you ever shared this with anyone before? And he says, just last night, I told my mom about this. I opened up to my mom and shared with her. And I say, well, what did your mom tell you to do? And he says, my mom told me that I probably need God. And I ask him, well, what did your mom say? Like, how do you get God? And he told me that his mom has no idea. She's not a Christian. She doesn't have any faith. And his mom basically said, good luck with that. The very next day is when I'm meeting with him. And I tell him, I don't know a lot of things, but I can tell you how to get God. And so I explain to him the great message of what Christ has done on the cross for us that he's made a way for us to have a relationship with God, to be freed from our sins, to be freed from this guilt and sadness and depression. And so I ask him in that moment, do you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, or do you want to think about it? This is a big decision. He said, no, this is what I need right now. So sitting outside the student center, I pray a brief prayer with him, confessing his sins and placing his faith in Jesus. I continue to meet with him for the next six months, working through uh, life and depression and talking with counselors, and slowly but surely, I see this amazing hope grow in his life. I just met with him last week. He actually had a rough baseball season, and his future for baseball is probably not going to happen. And I ask him, how are you doing with all of this? And with such joy and his shoulders back, he said, I have the hope of Christ in me. I know that my future will be great. And he's going to become a firefighter. But I just remember from that meeting, because of what Christ has done in his life, he's had so much hope and peace and joy over the last six months, no matter his circumstances. And how was this done for my friend Jake, the baseball player? How was it done for us? It is by grace. It's by the grace of Jesus Christ. In verse 7 of Ephesians, it says that this was all done by the riches of God's grace. In verse 6, it says, this was all done to the praise of God's glorious grace. And what is grace? It's undeserved favor. Grace cannot be earned. It is something that's freely given. We count on God's grace and the bridge he has built through Jesus Christ. And there are countless verses about grace. Our Heavenly Father says that he is rich in grace. He overflows with grace. His grace abounds. He gives grace upon grace to us. Grace helps us in our time of need. Knowing God's grace since eighth grade in this church has made all the difference in my life. As we face many, many trials in our lives, God's grace has made all the difference. God's grace has made all the difference in Jake's life. God's grace, hopefully, is making all the difference in your life as well. I want to end my time on Father's Day by sharing a story about my dad, Gary Barnett. Uh, In 2006, I had just graduated college, and I told my parents, I'm going to become a missionary. Not only am I going to become a missionary, but I need to raise all of my financial support for salary, for benefits, for the ministry. And my parents, who are wonderful, were a little nervous for me, as they should be. Uh, But I spent the summer of 2006 raising support through this church, through individuals in this church, through other churches. And near the, end of this, uh, near the end of that summer, as God was providing the support, I was in the fellowship hall here at a men's breakfast here at Dutill, and I shared about my ministry, shared about what God was doing in my life. 
And at the end of it, unprompted, my dad stood up. And he essentially said in front of all of these guys and a lot of bacon, he said, he said, I just want to let you guys know I love my son. I believe that he's doing great things. I think so highly of him, and I'm so proud of him. That meant all the world to me. And I want to let you guys know that your father in heaven today says to you that he loves you, that you're doing great, that he views you so highly and he's so proud of you at his child of God, that you are his child. All that we have to do to experience all of these blessings and these words from God is to accept it by faith. So let me end by saying, no matter what you're facing today, no matter what this church is facing in the future, these following statements have always been true, are true, and will forever be true of this church. Because of Christ's love lavished on us and through our faith in Christ by grace, all of us are chosen by God. We are adopted into his family. We are redeemed by God and we are completely forgiven. Let these truths impact all that we do, all that we think, and all that we say. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we adore you. Thank you for caring for us, for loving us, for valuing us. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that he has made a way for us to be in your family. And so, Lord God, we give you all praise, all glory, all honor. You are worthy of praise. And we thank you for this time to reflect and to worship you. And we adore you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.